Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 252 for Monday, April 13th, 2020. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, or welcome to Gig Gab. It's your first time visiting us. Uh, we are the show by, for, and about working musicians, and here in Durham, New Hampshire, haven't left yet. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. And you haven't left yet either, man, have you? There's nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, we've talked a lot about streaming the last few episodes, and I have no doubt that before this episode ends, we will talk more about streaming because we actually have some things to share. Uh, Because it's what a lot of uh, us, you, are doing these days. However, I did have some thoughts related to actually playing out that I think are worth musing upon now, while we might be able to rethink a little bit about what we're doing when we play out. Sound good? Muse away. Muse away. All right. These are totally random thoughts in no particular order. Uh, But one of them is is specifically for you, Paul, because I think about you a lot uh, in a good way, you know. Um, the, the, but, but we'll get to that one. The, the first thing, I don't know why, but I was watching a video. Somebody pointed, oh, somebody pointed out, uh, an old friend of ours, Jason O'Grady, pointed out that there was like a Mac Plus or something on stage with the Grateful Dead it, back in the 80s or something like that, right? Which would make sense. And he was trying to figure out what they were using it for. The picture, though, that let us see the Mac Plus that was sitting on side stage was a picture of across the stage of the dead, sort of from the top of, you know, above the band on one side of the stage facing the other side of the stage. And what I noticed in this picture was how staggered the microphones were, the vocal mics. It's so normal for us to set up a gig and think about putting all of our mics across like equal, equidistant from the front of the stage, right? Like that's a pretty normal thing to do. And the dead, at least on this particular stage setup, was not like that at all. Everybody had their own distance from the front of the stage. And it was obvious from this picture that it was set up that way so that when uh, I think it was uh, Brent that was playing keys in this particular picture. I'm not a huge dead fan, so please, folks, go easy on me. Um, uh, But, you know, uh, Bobby was in the basically in the middle of the stage. And then Jerry was between him and Brent, who was playing the keys, you know, over on stage left. And Jerry, Bobby and and Jerry's microphone, Bobby and Brent's microphones, so the keys and center stage were basically equidistant. I mean, keys were sort of in the midst of his, you know, keyboard arsenal there. But Jerry was was staggered way back. And it was obvious from looking at this. And then I found the video that the show was from so I could watch it because, you know, I figured I got some time. I'll go deep. I'll, I'll see. And it was obvious that they had set this up intentionally so that they could see each other, even if all of them were at the microphone simultaneously. Right. And, and for a band like that, who needed to be able to look at each other, because you know, my guess is they did lots of things that they didn't necessarily plan in advance. So you need to be able to see each other. You can't just be blind. I thought, what a great idea, you know, with fling, we've always uh, experimented with different setups and even like monkey fist, we found, that setting the three of us up straight across the front of the stage is terrible because we can't see unless we put Jimmy in the middle because Jimmy's shorter than Johnny and I. And then it, it sort of works that we can all see each other. But if we've got a different guitar player, we need to stagger and we wind up building like a horseshoe so that not a not an over exaggerated horseshoe, probably one that no one from the front ever even notices but it allows us to see each other. And so I just thought it was really interesting. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, here we are not playing gigs, but uh, you know, we're, I, I, if you're, if you folks are like me, you're probably all in touch with your bandmates and chit chatting and all that. And so, you know, obsessing and thinking about like all these little nuances that sort of go unnoticed when you're just, you know, slogging along and set up, go play the gig, pack it up. All right. See you tomorrow night, set up, go play the gig, see you tomorrow night, you know, that kind of thing. You don't really stop to think, Oh, and so, We've had this great pause gifted upon us. So let's uh, let's look at the, the glass half full parts of it. So that was one of my things. I don't know. Have you ever have you ever thought about that, Paul, at, at a gig and experimented with it or anything like that? I don't say that I've ever had a problem with line of sight to people. So, you know, mm-hmm. we have me, Nick, 
and Simon are kind of the front row. Yeah, but does Simon second, ever have a problem seeing Nick? That would be my question, right? Because you would be in the we way have of to that. Ask Simon, I, yeah. I would be in the way of that. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, would he look behind me? Yes. Sure. And again, when we play clubs, we're usually so sardined in on these stages that, right. you know, it's just a lean one way or another to get someone's to get someone's uh, attention. But sure. It's not really been a huge problem for us. You've brought this up several times. Yeah. And so clearly, you know, there's something about the vibe of your band that that uh, the onstage communication requires requires, you know, everybody to be all hands ready to go. Yeah. I, I can't, I will honestly say, I don't, I don't sense that as, as big a problem. Interesting. There are times. Yeah. Um, even, even in like you know, in your acoustic thing, acoustic madness or whatever, do you guys set up three across or do you horseshoe a little bit or, or no, three, three, three straight across. Straight across. And so it yeah. hasn't been a problem. And you know, again, you just lean behind the sure. person in the middle and then the two people in the ends can see each other. Sure. So it hasn't been a problem, but I understand the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. And, um, you know, I would just question is for Jerry, did he not like being up front? You know, you're, you're making the assumption that it was by design for on stage communication, which for a band like the dead, I guess I can totally understand that. Sure. But, um, but you don't know, did Jerry just want to feel more part of the rhythm section by being right. a little bit farther back? You know, there, there are other things that could have been uh, at play there. Totally, totally. But it, it was just really interesting. Like everybody had, as long as everybody was at their microphones, obviously guys that can move around could stand in a line of sight at any point if they chose to or accidentally did. But it was really interesting with everybody at their mics. Every every person had a direct line of sight to every other person that was unencumbered by anyone else standing at their microphone. So everybody could see the drummer if they needed, you know, or drummers if they needed. It was just really interesting. It was like, look at that. There's like this is this has got to be intentional. There's no way this is an accident, you know. Right. Um, and it, and and you could see them all kind of looking at each other. And like you said, maybe maybe Jerry chose the the drop back position so that he could also you know quickly interact with the with the drummers and and talk to Mickey, then communicate with Billy and and those sorts of things. But um, yeah, it was just really interesting. It's like oh, okay, I'm always thinking about this stuff. Trying to I I like. To have the stage, I mean, I think we all do. I don't think I'm alone here. This is not some special thing about Dave. But I, you know, I like the stage to be comfortable and easy and smooth so that, you know, the the only thing we have to work on is music, uh, not the like, oh, crap, I need to see his hand or what, you know, it's like, if I need to see his hand, no, I, I just look it. at his hand. You know, it's like, it's fine. I get it. I totally yeah. get it. Yeah. All right. So the next thing was we ended uh, one episode, and I don't remember when it was. I probably should have put it in the notes. I'll go find it. We were talking about your buddy had done a had taken a mix of uh, the or a, a multi track mix of your live your the House Rockers live performance of a tune uh, digging on James Brown. We, you had linked it from the House Rockers site, and we linked it from the show notes. And of course, I went and listened to it because a I'd like to listen to the House Rockers and b I like that tune and c we talked about it on the show, so I wanted to see what it was like. And you had mentioned that you, you know live these things sound great, but when you take them, uh, you know the individual multi tracks and and take them out of out of context and and just you know mix them, you really wind up hearing in an exaggerated sense the things like the vocals where, you know, if you just back off the mic a little bit, you get this kind of thing going on. Like, you know, there's a little bit of that. And, yeah. and, um, and so I started thinking, all right, how would we solve for this problem? And I really think that when you, and I realized that this live mix was sort of an after, I think was an afterthought. It wasn't a let's record this show and then, and then release it. Maybe it was, uh, but if you're going to record a show and release it, I think it's super important to put a stereo mic or two mics that in a stereo X, Y or something like that uh, at the mix house mix console and record those two. Obviously you don't want to put them back in the mains cause that'd be weird, but mm -hmm. re you know, record what, and, and, and I would even argue start with that as your foundation to the mix and then bring in all of those, you know, individual channels to like sweeten it up and maybe clear some out. But that mix in the room is the thing that you want to start with, unless you're playing just huge places. But even then, I would argue having some level of the room blended in there is going to help you sort of 
make it sound like a really good live recording. Live, yeah. 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 And, and so it probably would deal with some of that. This. Yeah. Uh, when we get when we come back around to talking about streaming, I'm going to have almost the exact same question for you. Mm. So put put this in your back pocket for now, okay. because that concept of the difference between a studio recording and a live recording and um, and, commu- you know, a studio recording, you have all of the tools in your toolbox to sweeten it and make the magic come out, right? You, you can you even re-record a track. If, if Exactly. If, right? You have, right. And you have, you can make a bunch of decisions about what's going to go into the recording and you can make a bunch of decisions about what's going to happen post the recording, um, uh, you know, to, to, to capture what it is you want to capture. You, right. you have all the variables that you play live. Some of those variables are out of your hands. And uh, you know, the question is what's best for the recording. So I'm going to have in about 10 minutes, a very, <laughs> very specific question for you that, that, uh, that, that bounces back in this and all, right. all the players are pretty much the same. So, yeah. Okay. So I, I like, I like the thought and I agree with it in, in, uh, in, in principle. And so you, what you're saying is, Straight up multi-track, yes, you're going to get a possibly well mixed. You know, like Mike is a great, a yeah. great mixer. Oh, sure. Um, you're possibly well mixed, but is there a layer of abstraction that captures the thing that made it feel so good live? And you're just saying X, Y mics, audience mics, ambient mics. Yeah, that's the key. Well, it gives you more options, you, you know. Like to your point, when you're performing live, once you've finished that show. There is unless you are going to break the quote unquote rules of which there are none. But, you know, if it, it, you could go back and re-record your vocal. Right. Just cut mm-hmm. it out. Re-record your vocal. Make it smooth. Make it clean. Good to go. Right. And and there are many live albums that are more that than live. And, you know, as a Rush fan, I'll tell you that Rush's exit stage left live album from the Moving Pictures tour was mostly studio with some live sound sort of bled in. It didn't start that way, but by the time they got to the end of the process, it was like, we've replaced almost everything, you know, uh, <laughs> not, and that's not entirely true, but it's probably 50, 50 based on, based on what they've said, which is fine. I mean, it's a great sounding album. It's fine. Um, but yeah, give yourself the options, right? If you know, you're going to record this and possibly use it later. It's like, well, let's let's record some some of the house noise. Let's get the crowd involved. Let's get what the mains actually sounded like involved because they are as much of a an instrument involved in in your sound as your pedal on your guitar. I agree. Is. Yeah. Right? I mean, like I mean, they think live albums are just a different beast than a than a recorded album. Totally. The, and the audience reaction to what's happening live is part of the experience of a great live album. Right. Yep. You know, when if a band, you know, does something different to their material, stretches apart, emphasizes apart, whatever it might be, how the audience reacts to it and how the live album reflects that, whether it's, you know, manually an engineer pushing the audience applause or the audience reaction, yeah. whatever it is, that's part of the experience that you're having. And that's actually part of what was happening when it was created. You right. played to that when you were performing. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it just, it was a, you know, it was an interesting thing. It was like, Oh, right. It, because I get the feeling that our, th- many of us are going to approach playing live and capturing how we play live very differently going forward than we have in the past because of what we're all experiencing, learning and and, you know, perfecting with this streaming thing. It's going to be like, well, why don't we start doing more of this live? We've got you know, we've got some mixers to talk about, too, that are kind of coming into the mix here. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> so. So, yeah, no, it's 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 good. Yeah. But but in a in a, you know, 10,000 foot view. Give yourself as many options later as you possibly can. Think about what you would want when you're sitting down to mix this thing. And and part of that's going to be you're going to sit down to mix it and go, oh, man, I really wish I had, you know, set up live mics or maybe added Tom mics, you know, to the drums, which in the room, yeah, it doesn't need it in that small club. But when you're going to, you know, record it and mix it, oh, yeah, I really wish I had a mic under the snare, maybe to get it some better you know, sizzle out of it, that kind of thing. You might, you'll find you're going to add more options just to give yourself that flexibility down the road. All right. One last thing, because I, I really, you know, we just before we uh, sort of went into lockdown mode here, at least in the USA, we had uh, a yet another conversation about 
in ears and streaming with Mike Dias from the I am Ito, uh, which was great, by the way. And and he and I still look back on that day because after we finished recording here, it was a beautiful day. It was the first beautiful day we'd had. And he and I went and walked downtown Durham and campus and everything. And it was basically a week later that it was like, yeah, you don't do that anymore. So it was it was a great day. However, I'm always thinking about what it's going to take to get you onto ears full time. And I don't know why I was down some other rabbit hole of, you know, music and technology. And somebody pointed out that they were saying, oh, yeah, you know, oh, it was delays in the studio as a drummer in a in a digital studio. It even like a high dollar digital studio on something very, very like tight and percussive, for example, hitting with my stick, hitting a closed hi hat. I am very used to immediate feedback from that. Like I'm used to hitting it and hearing it at the same time. When there's a, when I'm listening to my drums in a, you know, a digital studio and I have headphones on and I hit it, there's a slight flam. I'm also used to that live on my ears because the, you know, as it goes through a digital board, there is going to be some level of delay. Now, it's most boards and, and certainly studios that I've been in, including my, you know, little sort of makeshift studio here. The delay is noticeable in those very specific moments, but not at all a problem. In fact, I'm hearing it now when we record this podcast because I actually hear everything post processing. So there's a slight delay. I'm very used to it. In fact, I kind of like it because it gives me a little bit of perspective on on things and it doesn't mess me up. It doesn't slow me down when I talk as some of you may wish it did. Uh, <laughs> so I was reading about this. I don't know why. And, and people were saying, oh, somebody was saying, well, yeah, drummers notice this, tend to notice this more than guitar players because guitar players are used to hearing their amp from, you know, 12 to 15 feet away. And it hit me. It was like, oh, wait a minute. There might be something to this here. It's possible even going through a digital board that you're hearing your guitar too soon after you pluck the string and it doesn't feel like what you're used to when your amp is over there. Now, so I did some more research and it the, the general consensus is that every foot adds about a millisecond to the sound. So perhaps adding like a, you know, 10 to 15 millisecond delay on your ears even if it adds it to your vocal, you, that probably would be, you know, also it, when you're singing, you know, you're used to hearing from a monitor that's not right on top of your ear. Well, now your monitor is right on top of your ear. There's no delay uh, other than the delay created by your digital system, which is already factored in with your with your monitor wedge. Right. That's on the same delay. So you're hearing everything way sooner in your ears sure. than you're used to. So I wonder if there's like, I don't know. I don't even know. I'm thinking about the mixers that I know of and I don't know how I would go about adding. Like if you said, if we said, this is the problem, let's solve it. I honestly don't know how I'd go about solving it. I, that Like that's part two, perhaps of this conversation, because <laughs> I don't think mixers are built to do this, but it's, it was just like an interesting thought. You know what I mean? I don't know. I get it. Um, remember in a lot of the clubs are on my, my mic is my amp is literally under my feet. Sure. I, I but totally you're probably open to the idea. Hearing, if it's under your feet, you're probably hearing it off more off the back wall reflection or ceiling reflection than you are directly, you know, unless it's aimed at your ears, it might, it might be going past you and coming back. Some days it is uh, aimed at sure. my ears, depending on the stage. So, so possibly again, I think for me, it's a hypersensitivity to a changing mix over time, right? And yeah. as soon as things are not what I expect them to be, or as soon as my voice is not where it should be, yep. um, then, I, then you know, I'm like, oh, here we go again. And I take it out and then I'm kind of feeling the stage. And, it's, and I, think, I think even if you have a good mix, once you get out of that cocoon environment and then you're kind of living in the live it's hard to go back in, I think. Well, I mean, yeah, because you're, you're kinda... hearing all those reflections, right? Like when your ears yeah. aren't in, you 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 get your sound in many different ways as opposed to only one way, right? Yep. With, with the ears, it, it is. You're right. It's a very pristine, clean cocoon. Uh, yeah. Those words are not wrong at, at all because you're not hearing it bouncing off the back wall or the ceiling right. or anywhere else. I, I think Mike nailed it when he was here. Uh, I, I think your micro, your vocal mic is picking up the more of the stage than 
than you want it to be, especially when mm. it's feeding your ears. I, I think that's a big part of the I think it's certainly worth experimenting with a vocal mic that has a tighter pattern, you know, less uh, more off axis rejection, all of that stuff, because um, you're on like a beta 87 or something like that. Right. Fifth, uh, 58. Beta 58. Yeah, those just pick up so that I've always the beta series, it, they you can make them sound good. But from a monitoring standpoint or even just a live sound standpoint, they can be a real pain in the neck because they because they pick up just everything. Um, right. You know, so I think I think that would be that would be the first place I would I would experiment with with you is, is a tighter vocal mic. Yeah. <sighs> I know. So, you know, but these are the things that we have more time to sit and think about because we're, we're not, you know, driving to and from gigs and setting up and playing and all that stuff. So, all right. Play? So I'm going to funnel all of your interesting thoughts okay. into into my experience from last weekend. Yeah. So we usually do a segment where I say, hey, Dave, did you play this weekend? You say, hey, Paul, did you play this weekend? <laughs> so I streamed last Thursday, my second show. Okay. And I think uh, hopefully most of the listeners know after my first show and after, uh, you know, talking to you, I thought about, and we had Steve Witchell on last week. Right. Um, I was thinking about everything that I've learned about streaming so far. Right. Yep. And I wrote, I wrote an article and I posted it on the gig gab podcast site. And we, we distributed it in a few different places and got some nice comments about it. And I think it was philosophically helpful to get people to kind of conceptualize what they're about to kind of dive into. Right. A lot of people have just, have just turned on the mic and turned on the camera and, and they go and, and that's kind of cool. So I'm in a really interesting discussion having done it twice now. And I will say this, I have a mixer that has a, a USB out. My friend Dave Hamilton said, you don't need to get anything real fancy. Just get that Apple camera connection kit, which kit, which turns basically a USB C connector into um, a Thunderbolt connector, right? So I could get the sound right into my phone. Yeah, you learned a few you, things about yeah, it. It's a lightning or whatever on your on your phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Now here's a question. Okay. And again, it's relative to everything that we're talking about now. So yeah. I uh, I did a I started a, a private Facebook page and invited a couple of my musician and sound friends to kind of let me do a sound check for them and. Oh, nice. And yeah, and it, and it was helpful for me to learn what was coming out of this Bose mixer. For two shows now, I am just, it just doesn't, it feels antiseptic to me. So I have, you know, some reverb on my, it's just me, my vocal going through the mixer and acoustic guitar. Yep. But it feels a little too pristine for me. It doesn't feel like the experience of seeing, feeling a live show. And my one friend, Mike O'Brien, who's really one of the most respected sound guys around here, he's like, you have to have everything going through the mixer. Your, your mix is important. You're a musician. The, the, the polish of your sound is so important to your, who you are. Do that. And I'm like, it just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't sound right. It sounds just kind of too squeaky clean for me. And he's been a big advocate against adding a third mic, which is an ambient mic. Uh, so that's what my yeah. solution is, yeah. is to do basically what you've been saying is like add a little bit of room. So, the first thing I want to do is ask you your opinion. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? It's just a guy and a guitar. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, many people are just putting a mic, one mic up and, and, you know, or just using the mic on their phone and the experience is okay. Generally not a bad experience, but not quite as clean or mixed as, as you would want it to be. Some people are putting that mic up, still going through a PA and just catching what the PA is putting out. So you can mix it in the PA, sure. add some effect, but it's still essentially an ambient pickup. I mean, I'm thinking about when I hear live music, when I go to hear live music, it is different than a record. And I don't expect it to be like a record. And, you know, the, the, the depth of sound from, different in different size environments are part of the deal that at least in my brain is what brings the experience alive. Oh, absolutely. We are, well, I mean, a venue is as much often more a part of the sound than, than you might want it to be sometimes. Right. But, but it's definitely part of the instrument. Like you, you know, it, well, I was going to say no one, Hopefully no one listening to this show, but uh, most good bands don't just show up at a venue, turn on their amps, turn on their PA and play. 
you play your guitar and you listen. Oh, in this room, I need less low end or the person in charge of the PA tunes the PA to the room. So they right. I mean, so the room is definitely part of that experience, part of that instrument. And so the the echoes, the reverbs, the the, you know, the ambience yeah. of feeling like you're in a hall. It's different than what you can just dial in, I, I believe, by adding some reverb to, to the instruments at, at the mixer level. So there is. I have some thoughts, though, because it, now I will preface all of these by saying, absolutely. If you think that you should experiment with a thing, you should experiment with that thing like we all should. And we should share those experiences and 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 learn from ourselves and each other and all of that, because there is no way to know if it's right or wrong without testing. Right. And and so that's just like, I think it's great that you're doing your little experiments, but also just over time, like none of us, I guarantee you, nobody here has approaches their live sound the same way today as you did say 10 years ago or even one year ago. You know, it's always it, it you listen, you hear, you evolve. My th but but there is a thing that as a, a podcaster I've always thought about and that's that here I am recording a thing in my room for you to play in your room. That is different than you and me sitting in the same room with you listening to me speak. In that sense, the sound of that shared room is something that's part of the deal, just like it is if you go and play at a club or you go to see a band play at Madison Square Garden, which is actually a great sounding room. Uh, it, you know, like those things are shared. But when I'm podcasting here, I have always approached it from the standpoint of, you don't want the sound of my room added to the sound of your room. And so we, we release pretty dry. There's a, there's a little secret that, that I'll let everybody in on. We have just enough reverb on this signal for you to barely hear it, but it makes it sound like Paul and I are in the same room, even though we're, you know, thousands of miles apart. Um, it, but other than that, we record as dry as we can. In fact, I'm constantly telling Paul, get closer to your mic so that, you know, we don't hear as we hear more of his voice and less of his room. Um, I would think that there is some level of that philosophy that applies to this live streaming thing. And that I think that might be what your buddy is trying to tell you. However, it's not like this is a binary choice. Like you, you don't have to do all ambient versus all uh, you know, tight mix, you, like you said, you can add a third mic and you can blend it in until it gets to a point where it's like, aha, there's the magic little mix. This is great. And, and so I would, I, you know, I would experiment with it for sure, but bear that in mind that, you know, people are going to be listening in their rooms. And I would say, go back and listen to your show in a different room than you recorded it in on several different sets of speakers. Try it with a head set of headphones. Try it with, you know, just the speakers on your phone. Try the speakers on your computer. Try your Sonos speakers, you know, like and, and get a feel just like you would if you were recording, uh, you know, get a feel for what that sounds like in a lot of different places because yeah. you, you you don't know until, you know, you know, and you're the artist. So you get to decide what it is you want to deliver to people. Uh, but you know, you want to, you want to do that, not based on, you want to do that based on experience. So, you know, you just have to go and listen, I think is the key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's no so, wrong answer. Yeah. So here's the next part of that question. So one of the nice things is we also have a bunch of big time artists with unlimited resources doing these streams now. Right. Unlimited and money, but not necessarily unlimited resources. They don't have all the stuff at home that they might want. <laughs> sometimes yes, and sometimes right. no. So like, right. like uh, on this thing that Elton John did the other day, you know, Dave Grohl was doing it from a home studio that looked like a pretty decked out studio. Yeah. Neil Diamond was doing it in front of his fireplace, which was clearly just the microphone on his phone, right? right. There was no mixing. There was no anything. And this is actually where I... I I diverge a little bit from my good friend, Mike O'Brien. He is a great audio engineer. Sure. And he is arguing the engineer's perspective, which is like, you know, make the sound as good as possible. And I'm backing up a little bit and I'm saying, well, this experience is blending two things. It is a live performance in a, in a, 
digital format in a, in a, in a con, reasonably yeah. contained format. And um, what is communicating the message of the music the best is really what the interesting thing is. And I don't, I don't know that I've heard anything that is, there's a certain listener tolerance to imperfection over this because you're going to get it anyway because your internet connection is going to change yep. over the time that you're listening to a piece. So that's, that's built into the, into the equation as well. I've gotten some good compliments that the sound coming out of my streams has been, they can tell that it's not just, you know, a mic on a phone, Yeah. Um, but it doesn't quite feel like my performance is what is what I'm feeling. And that's, you know, Mike's perspective that I, I, if I add ambience, it'll probably muddy up the, the original, the source. I don't, I don't know about that, but yeah, well, there's one way I'm to find play out, those things. right? Yeah. yeah there's one way to find out. I, I mean, you add, like, that's the gift. Like, you know, I, I, I talked about the great pause, the, the gift that we've been given here. Like that's, that's the flip Time, side, yeah. right? Like, why not experiment with it? And, you know, it's not like you have to only ever do it one way if you make a decision. If right. you decide it's not so good, okay, don't do it that way next time. <laughs> and now you know. And that leads me yeah. That leads me to this kind of final point is that, and then, you know, I've been told, have one of your in-ears in so you can hear what you're sending out to the audience, right? Mm. So now I'm three mics a mixer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in ears. And I'm just trying to strum my freaking acoustic guitar. Right. You gotta, and it's you gotta, all, you gotta and plan then, a load in and a setup time for well, your that's it. And, and, <laughs> and as I you know shared in this article, part of the challenge of this stuff is to communicate a decent performance, but knowing, you know, like, I know when I'm watching the Facebook live stream and then you see the bubbles coming up, I can't hear it. You know, there's all sorts of technical things coming at you to do anything from let you get grounded in performing the music is hard. So are we overthinking these things? Uh, and that's actually a really interesting question, right? So I have an engineer saying, you know, go right into a board, mix it and send it out. And that's the best way I'm saying, well, that doesn't quite entirely work for me. And, um, those people who are just, you know, taking the the phone mic of what's, you know, using a small PA and capturing that, what is, what is for everybody? And again, it's, for me, I'm clearly struggling to kind of kind of get feeling natural and I'm really feeling encumbered by having one eye on the technology, adding more mics and, you know, in ears and all the type of stuff it just seems like it's more overhead of hassle when the vibe is I'm playing singer songwriter stuff and I'm just communicating, you know, pretty, pretty stripped down music, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, this all counts when you are considering how to, how to perform. And I think, you know, there are a lot of technical solutions that you can throw at all these different types of things. Um, I'm not sure. I, I haven't found Nirvana yet. I found moments in Nirvana sure. where I know everybody out there seems to be hearing me, seems to be getting a better than iPhone mic signal. And I know when I forget about everything else and I can just play a song, those are the most effective moments of my live streams, but they are <laughs> surrounded by quite a bit of stress and quite a bit of, you know, overthinking and, you know, you know, considering things. And, uh, we did the, what I did on Thursday, um, about 90% of the way through, I had the, Good fortune. My wife was in the room with me and she was manning the comments. I wasn't even looking at the comments. Huge help. Right. So I was going to say I spent I did not stream at all this weekend. Well, I did. I streamed our Mac Geek Gab uh, podcast, which we've always done audio. Recently, we've started doing a video, as I mentioned here. And and that I mean, it, I totally understand because it comes with the, like this whole other level of distraction uh, trying to manage all that. Uh, but Musically, this weekend, I played a bunch in that I recorded a ton of stuff for the fling tracks that were putting together. And the vocals were the first. Th this was the first weekend that I recorded any vocals. There's a tune that I I mean, there's a bunch of harmonies I have to sing. And then there's uh, at least one tune that I'm singing a lead vocal on. And I thought, you know, I can do it here. I've got my setup. It's not terrible. I can, you know, engineer myself. But it's hard producing yourself. Right. And yes. there's a difference there. So I, I, I enlisted my daughter, who's a, a drummer in her own right, huge music fan. She's a singer, too. You know, she's an actor. Uh, and I'm like, come over and produce me. Like, I'll teach you how to engineer this stuff so you can hit the red button. Like, that, that part's fairly straightforward. But come on over and, and at least, you know, bounce some ideas. Tell me what I did right. Tell me what I did wrong. We can stitch these things together. And having another human involved made this made it so much easier for me to sing 
a vocal part because it was like I'm not stuck yeah. in that, you know, alone in a room scenario, which to be fair, I I ha- I have struggled with recording drum parts too. you know, being alone in a room. You know, you're just alone. You're like, oh, OK. It's like, no, you got to play like you're playing for people. You're playing with people. Don't forget that. You know, so with drums, I close my eyes and I, you know, I can uh, envision playing for people or whatever. But having her here in the room and and all of that makes a difference. And like you said, having your wife there, not just as an audience member, although she very much is a proxy for the entire audience. She now was interacting with the audience. Right. And yeah. and that. That's huge. I think that's that's a if you've got somebody in your house and you can remain safe and, you know, not adding people to the mix and messing up all our, you know, social distancing and all that stuff. Absolutely. Enlist them. Remember, everybody's sitting around doing nothing. So if you're especially for you, right, for you and Terry, if you're off, you know, doing your live stream, well, she's alone. And maybe she likes her a long time. Don't get me wrong, but this might give her something to do. And, you know, when I told Sky, my daughter, you know, okay, tomorrow you're going to come over. And she's like, what? And I'm like, no, 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 it'll be fun. And when we, you know, I said, she said, how long is this going to be? I said, maybe an hour. We wound up tracking some drum stuff. We did a whole different vocal take on something else. We were here for like two and a half, three hours. And when we got back home, she was like, Wow, we were gone for a long time. Like, yeah, you can lose hours in the studio. Like, <laughs> you know this, kiddo. You've done this before. She's like, I forgot. Right. She's like, that's fun. Like, I know it was fun. So it does. It cool. ad- yeah, it adds to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you know, like I said in, in the article, my biggest reflection was the ability to just play your music when you've got to have one eye on the on the tech and one eye on the on the you know the the music tech. I think there's some overthinking of it going on and totally. gets in the way of doing something really good. So, well, another thought for you, you know, if and you or anybody listening and, you know, I point this at me, too. If you are finding that recording, you know, streaming and recording essentially simultaneously, because that's what you're doing, you're broadcasting, you know, but it's it is a recording that you're just immediately sharing. If that adds to too much distraction to the mix for you to be comfortable with the music, the product that you're putting out. There is the option of recording it locally, yes. not sharing, not streaming, and then upload the video to Facebook, upload the video to YouTube and share it that way. And and then you've got more control. You can see it. You can you can produce yourself in a sense because you're giving yourself more time and you can focus on one thing at a time and, and maybe for some of us, that's a better product. I mean, it's, you know, it's there's no again, there's no wrong way. There's no right way. It's just different ways and whatever works. Well, that, that's and that's actually the probably best point that we brought up here is like, why? Why stream? So I know some good mm-hmm. players who are taking requests, going off and learning the song and recording their song and posting, a you know, fairly polished. Yeah. No mistakes, you know, version. Say, so here's the song you requested. Thanks for the tip. And that's cool. Um to me, streaming is a um, it is a special event like connection with your audience, right? Um, you are promising a certain amount of immediacy and a certain amount of intimacy. And remember, this stuff was largely, I mean, even the Facebook Live stuff, I believe, was largely built because streaming gamers playing games became a thing, right? And a huge thing. Right. It was not this stuff was not built for, for musicians to stream concerts. No, they I were mean, built certainly, as certainly Twitch was built that way. I, yeah, I don't know. Is that what's Facebook Live? Is that what catalyzed? I'll tell it? you. Yeah. You know, if you look, if you look at like OBS. Yeah. If you look into the bowels of Facebook Live and the, and the instructions about how to use it, you all of a sudden come across sp- specific references for gamers. You don't come across specific references for musicians. Yeah, right. You're like, if, right. you know, if you're using this video card, this is probably best for you, right? And so the, the essence of where this stuff comes from is largely, that, like, Facebook is smart. That's largely for for marketers, right? Yeah, and if you look right, in yeah. the back end of Facebook Live, there's a whole bunch of terminology and a whole bunch of widgets and a whole bunch of technology to help marketers monetize things so Facebook can monetize of things, course. right? So, of course. so the, these tools were not built. They, you know, they were adaptable for musicians to do what they do, but these tools are not naturally built for these types of things. And um, I think uh, uh, as we apply them, thinking about what is, what is the best way 
to represent. And you're right. Um, you know, I, it, I think I'm using mine now as a weekly special event. It is a way I talk to current people who listen to me and try and attract more people to listen to me. And the value of it is the immediacy. Right. Is the value to everybody the immediacy, right? And if not, yeah, go back and record something and put out a polished product. You know, at the end of the day, that one hour that you stream then turns into a video that just lives on and people you get X percentage of the total traffic for your performance after the fact as you do during, during well, the actual you can, stream. You can split the difference too. You, you know, you can host a, a watch party and you can do that on YouTube. You can do it on Facebook where you are streaming or playing the, a thing you've already created, but now you can, you know, time shift yourself. So you've done the, the, I don't want to say that the rest of it is an art, but you've recorded your music, right. And you're putting that out there and now you can interact with your crowd yes. in real time while they're listening Absolutely. to it for the first time. Fish did that last week or the week before they released their new album, Sigma Oasis. And they were like, cool, well, we're just going to stream it. Uh, but, you know, we recorded this months ago, guys, like we're not playing it right now, but we're and they were there on video chat. You know, they they set up like a Zoom thing and, and blended it all together. So you'd, you'd hear some of the stuff and then hear them talk about the songs. And like, that's a cool thing, I, you know. And and as soon as I saw it, it was like, well, when we've got some fling tracks ready to go, we're definitely going to do that and get us all together and chit chat and even if nobody watches like that'll be a blast to sit and talk about this thing that we've spent you know weeks or months crafting together uh, but I think that's the kind of thing people want to see one of the Absolutely. kinds of things it's there is no that's what I did with the first house rockers right. streamed event we all right. recorded stuff and then then the nice thing was all the band members could be on the chat mm -hmm. you know for the whole time that's right you've already done this that's right you're a pioneer man this is well, we're just trying, that's what, but the questions I ask is what is the value of doing it any other way? Like on my PK music page. And, and again, you and I tend to talk more about Facebook than other platforms. However, you know, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, even LinkedIn, right? I mean, yeah. they all have their audiences and, you know, I, I think we should do a show that's all about audience acquisition and, and uh, you know, and about what you're doing when you're doing these things. Because I think it's incredibly valuable to look through the, the, the prospects of using streaming to grow your audience while you're not performing on stage. And then even when you do get back on stage, you will now have this toolkit of marketing yourself to get more people to come see you live on stage. Cause that day will come back. But I do right. think, right. Um, yeah, let us not yeah. forget. That's right. Yep. Yeah. But you know, Facebook live is um, it is, it is where most of my localized audience um, has come to get used to hearing about my things. They, they live on Facebook more than they live on other platforms. But I know that there's many, many people in many different geographies that I could possibly be reaching um, if I adopted those things. Yeah. I want to say that uh, the last thing that I've, last thing on streaming today is, you know, the tools are interesting. Um, there are, um, I've looked into three tools, three tools and no tools. So okay. the last stream I did was just, press go on a Facebook live thing. Sure. Pluses and minuses to that unexpected things. You know, it's really, it's, it's a bit of a mess. I, the first one uh, I did for the house rockers, which was pre-recorded content. And the reason I used the tool OBS was because it allowed me to load up a pre-recorded video and it streamed it for me. Right. There's no way to do that with Facebook live that I know of that you can, you know, point it at, at pre recorded content and tell it to stream it. I, I couldn't do that. I think, so you I, can, at, I think you can, there is a way to host a watch party for something that's pre-recorded. I, I, I started looking into it for the aforementioned reasons. And it seems like there's a thing like I can, yeah, in fact, there definitely is. I can go find a video that exists on Facebook and say, I want to host a watch party for that video that already exists. You just go, yeah. yeah. So you could put the video up, like you said, put it up in a private way, get it all up there, everything's happy, and then say, okay, now it's live. Let's host, oh, let's cool. host a watch party. Then you do the same thing on YouTube. You can set it as like a, uh, YouTube calls it a premiere, right? Like a movie premiere. It's like, okay, we've got the content. Here ah. it is. Set it as a premiere. We're all going to watch it at the same time together. And then you've got the chat and all that stuff. So yeah, I think Facebook and will do it too. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. So that, that kind of brings to mind that one of the ways you could use streaming is kind of do a, a premiere of like, in essence, a director's cut 
right? Yeah. Like, like I said, I had the house rockers online answering questions because they all contributed a segment to this longer thing that we did. And they're all saying hi to fans. And then they're, you know, if someone has a question, Hey, you know, that's pretty cool. How'd you do that? That, you know, it's that immediacy. And I guess that's really what streaming is about is the, how you make immediacy work for you. Right. 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 Um, right. But, yeah. um, but I've, you know, I, I have one go round with, with OBS. I have two go rounds with um, just pressing go live on my phone. Yep. Um, I started looking at this tool called StreamYard after we talked to Steve Witchell last week. Sure. And then I started looking at a really another interesting tool called um, Switcher Studio, which is an iOS based tool. Okay. And, and the nice thing about StreamYard, uh, uh, Switcher Studio, OBS, these all allow you to have multiple cameras and they all allow you to do simple things like, you know, put some graphics overlaid over your image of you playing, whether you want it to be a, a, a logo up in the corner for the whole time that you're playing, whether you want your name to come up and your email address, whether you want information about um, about where people can tip you, um, you know, that can pop up on the bottom third of the, of the screen sure. for a little while and go away. But so all cool, um, not not terribly technically difficult to do in any of them. But it is another layer of technology that you got to manage. You got you know, you to master and manage. Yeah, we've yeah. we messed with we used OBS the first week for Mac Geek Gab, and that was fine. Um, and then since then, we've been using uh, a tool that I've mentioned a couple of times called Mimo Live from a company called Boinks, B-O-I-N-X. And again, it's just a TV studio in a box, right? It's great. Yeah. And Mimo Live really, it, you know, it allows me to stream to multiple destinations simultaneously. So Facebook and YouTube can just liven up and I don't have to do anything else to make that happen. It's all straight from here. Uh, and it also has a built in uh, video conferencing tool so that my co-host, who like you, is not in the room with me, uh, yeah. can be in the virtual room with me with very limited uh, technological overhead to to kind of encapsulate it, and so for that reason, yeah, Mimo Live is fantastic, and it's cool. Like, but I've gone nuts. Uh, well, I haven't gone nuts with it. There's like there's so much untapped, but I my mixer has like five MIDI buttons on it. Yeah, and yeah. they're you know they're they're just MIDI buttons. They're not anything in particular, and so I thought, wait a minute, I can assign these. And so I use I'm a geek. Right. So I use this app called Keyboard Maestro to sort of be the glue that holds it all together. <laughs> and and now I have it that when because I can I can set up multiple in Mimo Live and you do this in OBS and I'm sure all these other apps, too. You you set up you, you're not building you. You're, you're, you're not intended to build the views that you just described on the fly, right? You build the view with you and your lower third. You build a separate view, like for my show, I'll build, you know, a view where it's us side by side. Then I have a view where it's just one of us or just the other. And everything's a little different. You tweak that ahead of time. And then you just switch between these scenes, right? And so I now have assigned these soft MIDI buttons on my mixer to the different scenes so i don't have to even think about it i just i know in my fingers which scene is which i just go and hit the button <laughs> and boom well but now i can like by myself produce this video show that when my co-host starts talking and i know that he's going to go for a little while i just hit the thing so they're just seeing him so they don't have to see me sitting here you know kind of twiddling my thumbs listening uh and and vice versa and it's not a huge headache but this is and how you, you are making my point for me however because yes yeah. in a in a podcaster environment or in a gaming environment yes your hands are on your keyboard and you can make these decisions that's right when i'm playing guitar or you're playing drums you know you, you a you have to think about oh I, I forgot to ask for tips for a while i better i better hit this button and get the tips you know yeah stuff. but you could and, get a and, midi like you could get those they have those midi like taurus pedal type things so yeah. you could you could have uh, i mean it would be you know one more yet one more thing to manage but yeah. you could have one pedal for oh throw the overlay of the tip jar up you know for 25 seconds or something and another pedal that does this and tie it all together so that you're just being able to play and like do your yeah. thing so i don't know i mean it's like there are options there are like and it's just geeky tech but it means more toys there are. I, I mean, I would add to whatever I had before. I also had a, you know, a Bluetooth page turner for my yeah. iPad lyric cheat sheet and, you know, just a couple of things. And that thing glitched a little bit while I was playing. Of course. And then 
And, but there's that thing again, my brain, when one thing glitches, you start going through a checklist of what you're going to do. You then are reminding yourself, Oh shit, the camera's looking at me right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then as I'm, as I'm processing this thing, like when you and I do this, you know, when we podcast, we're just voices on a microphone, right? Yeah. Like if you were to see my face as you say some things that would, that would change the conversation sometimes. Right. You know, so, maybe, and maybe we should do that. Maybe we should memo live this thing. Uh, it's, I'm sure somebody's going to ask us to at some point. So, you know, it's, it's possible. If, if you're very comfortable with technology, I guess you keep, you know, playing and, you know, you, and it's just technology. And, but yeah. I know for me, like I play music that is stories. Right. And I really want to be in the story to try and, you know, there are people who sing way better than me that play that way better than me. I think one of my, one of my few secret sauces is the ability to dive into something that's meaningful to me and try and, you know, express it musically. Right. Things that get in the way of that, <laughs> Cause me a lot more pain than the average person. That, no, that's fair. No, you have to know yourself. That, like, for me, I, I am it, like Mr. ADD, right? So anything I can do to make myself make the moment more immersive is is good for me. It actually enhances my performance, and sometimes that means thinking about you know, okay, I've got all this extra stuff going on, like you know, here. I'm st I'm tagging chapter marks while we're doing this. I'm pulling links for the things that we mentioned. Like if you saw me while I was doing this show, you'd see that I'm a, I'm a very busy person. I'm making little notes so that when you say a thing, I'm not interrupting you. And I, I mean, I sometimes do, but you know, I make little notes here. So it's like, Oh, we'll circle back to that. Like there's constantly stuff going on, but that allows me to be in the moment. But that, but that's, mm. that's, it's all about learning how to live with yourself. Right. Yeah. And, and you pointed out that for you, you want to just lose yourself in the story of the song and the technology for you brings you out of it. And I get that. Like that's, you know, like you gotta, yeah, you gotta figure it out for you. And that's the beauty of all of this is even if we all had exactly the same tech and all the same toys, we would, sure. we would produce a different thing because we're different humans and that's, what's great. Yep. And and we've proven that, right? Because a lot of people are out there just doing this with their iPhones. And yet so much variety uh, in the end product. And it's like, yeah, OK, it's good. Fun. Send us your thoughts, though, especially, uh, you know, Paul, you mentioned that in a future episode, we're going to talk about marketing yourself. How do you market yourselves? Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We really like to hear about what you're doing so that we can share that with everybody too. That'd be, that'd be fun it's, and, and valuable, I think for all of us. So, cause I think we're going to be streaming our live shows when we, when, you know, when we get out of lockdown here, I, I think there a lot more of us are going to wind up doing that. Cause now we have, you know, we've built up this thing and especially if you build up an audience, that's people that couldn't come to your live shows too. So right. yeah, that's what I got for today. You got anything else, Paul? No, good conversation. Yeah, good. As always, thanks for listening, folks. Mm -hmm. Fun. Always Stay be performing. Safe. Always. Yeah. Stay productive enough to remain sane. It's my wish for us all this week. Boom. <laughs> <laughs>